So all that stuff, I mean, when we talk about these systems, integumentary, skeletal, muscular, nervous system, endocrine, this is all what we're gonna cover here in this system. And then cardiovascular, all these other ones you're gonna cover in 145. And again, it's gonna get very heavy into the physio part of all that because you're dealing with trying to maintain homeostasis of all your cells, all right? So, you know, this is just a little bit, a couple slides about this, which is in your book. You know, when you're looking at anatomy versus physiology, anatomy is all about the structure, right? Regions of your body, marking structures, 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 all these different parts. And for physio, right, it's going to be more, you know, you know, again, again, functions, 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 right? Different types of physio. This is from your book right there, all these different types, but really you kind of want to think of it as cell physiology, right? What's going on in the cell and its external environments and inside, which will mainly be largely focused on like membrane transport and stuff like that. But then we'll be going over the physiology systematically, right? And again, the muscular physiology, the nervous system physiology, right? There's other fields like pathophysiology, which we'll mention along the course of the way, just to kind of highlight some major features right there. But these are the sort of branches of physiology and we'll really be focused starting at the level of cells, right? And then kind of combining them all to form these organ systems. So here we are back at, you know, this whole kind of all the systems, right? Your integumentary, but then you got these openings to the external environment for exchange of gas or nutrients and waste, right? Letting it into the body and then your cardiovascular system is bringing all that stuff to the trillions and trillions of cells in your body, right? And so these cells only exist in certain conditions, right? So those physical, physiological parameters of the cells have to be maintained, right? This is where we get into the physiology kind of really basic concepts of what will be covered over and over again. So I'm gonna go over it, a pretty simple concept, but in a little more detail, right? A little bit more explanation. So again, if you're thinking of that amoeba, it's sitting upon a single cell all by itself, and it's bringing in oxygen, it's letting out CO2 through its cell membrane, bringing in nutrients uh, through some kind of mechanism or other, letting out uh, metabolic waste Right. And it's doing all that in this pond right here that has the oxygen and stuff and nutrients around it right over here. And if it has it, it has it. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Right. Kind of like this fish bowl. Imagine if there was an amoeba in here or even this fish, right? It's sitting in a fish bowl. It's sitting, you put it out, you fill it up with a certain temperature water, right? And you put the fish in, you leave it out. If it gets cold in the room, the water gets cold and the water uh, and the amoeba gets cold, right? Uh, the uh, fish uses up all the oxygen. There's less oxygen in here. It starts peeing a lot and you build up waste in this right here, right? So you're kind of in this little fishbowl where you don't have ways of regulating all that material, so to speak, right? Whereas if you're in this fishbowl, you got these systems. You got a little heater right here, which detects when the temperature drops. And then the heater turns on, it warms up the water. There's a bubbler system that maintains oxygen, fresh oxygen through it and maybe filters out waste, right? So you got these systems to kind of maintain a certain temperature, right? A certain environment over here, like versus this one where, you know, in the case of the amoeba in a pond, the pond doesn't really care about the amoeba, right? It's just gonna be cold or warm or salty or whatever and the amoeba just dies or lives depending on how well it can tolerate those conditions, right? So here's an amoeba, here's the body cells, right? These guys are not sitting there alone. It does have a caring system, right? You've got oxygen being brought in by the blood vessels. You got CO2 being taken away by the blood vessels, right? You got nutrients being brought into these by the blood vessels and waste being taken away, right? And then of course, you know, how we get oxygen in, how we get nutrients in is a whole other system, right? But these are taken care of uh, because the whole systems are working to keep these cells alive, right? In the right conditions, right? So another very simple, just basic idea, which 
if I asked you about it, you'd, you'd know it already, but keep this in mind, keep something like this concrete in mind when you're talking about, when you're looking at pictures like this, right? These aren't just floating cells in water, right? They're actual cells that are combined to form tissues and everything and all the physiological parameters and systems that we're gonna talk about are there to keep these cells alive, right? That's the basic unit that we gotta worry about because if these cells die, then the tissue that they're within dies and then you die, right? So when you're thinking of these abstract sort of pictures, it's always good to have things concrete in your mind, right? So these cells over here, which are receiving oxygen, might be this cell right here, getting blood oxygen from this blood vessel right over here. And the CO2 is leaving through the veins over here. Well, that would be capillaries, but you get the idea, right? So that's an actual, this is the cartoon abstract kind of uh, picture here. Here's more, a little bit more of an actual situation, right? Blood bringing in all the nutrients and oxygen and taking away all the waste, right? Here's another situation. Here's a muscle cell surrounded by these capillaries. Here's the blood vessels bringing in oxygen and nutrients and stuff and taking away the waste, right? These blood vessels will be connected to the respiratory and digestive system. So all that happens, right? Again, think concrete. Don't think in these little things. When you look at these, have your favorite tissue or organ in mind. Right, so you could put this in a very much more concrete setting. That's the easiest way to remember things. Right? So for all these over here, right, that's what you want to think of, right? Oxygen and stuff and nutrients coming in. And then you're doing all that to keep these cells alive, right? So to do that, right, the cells have got to be in a very particular condition, right? So all these systems are working to form a very stable internal environment that is the surroundings of the cell, despite any changes that might happen, right? So in the case of the aquarium, it got cold, and then a thermometer detected that and turned on the heat, right? So you want a stable internal environment despite the fact that the temperature dropped, right? So this is all about homeostasis, the unifying theme of physiology. This is the basic theme that will be throughout you, throughout us, through 144, and even more so because you'll really be talking about those mechanisms in 145, right? The word homeostasis, uh, homeo means sameness, kind of the same, not exactly the same. Home, homo means the same, but homeo means kind of like it, right? It's kind of the sameness, not exactly the same. And then stasis technically means standing still. Physiologists don't like this word because it's really a dynamic maintenance, right? So a lot of people think of this as homeodynamics, maintenance of a stable internal environment despite changes, right? This doesn't mean there's a constant internal environment. You don't always have 37 degrees. It changes slightly, but it's, it's gonna change it's gonna maintain it so that the cells can actually live and function in it, right? And so what these physiological me mechanisms are doing are keeping variables within physiological parameters, right? We're gonna kind of go over really basic stuff. And again, this isn't something that you have to know for any particular test, but you're gonna to have to know it for the entire course, right? It's going to be a constant theme. We're going to look at how the systems might do it and what these this terminology means, right? So it's about keeping these variables, homeostasis, about keeping these variables within physiological parameters, right? So here we're going to look at a cell, kind of like that amoeba, but again, you maybe want to picture this at uh, maybe this is a muscle cell that contracts, maybe it's a nerve cell that conducts uh, impulses, maybe it's an immune cell that crawls around and protects your body against other thing, right? Or maybe it's an amoeba. Anyway, that'd be all right, right? So inside the cell to do all that kind of work, right? Uh, you also have the cell to keep itself alive, right? You've got all this biochemistry going on, right? Uh, so that you have 
something like this, right? A is being converted to B. And let's just say that's a biochemical reaction that keeps the cell alive, okay? So you got these trillions of cells in your body with thousands of these reactions going on inside each cell, right? This kind of reaction to keep the cell alive, right? All this biochemistry going on. And so substance A in our hypothetical example needs to be converted to substance B to can keep the body alive, right? And this, and this doesn't just happen by itself. It's going to be mediated by an enzyme. And it's gonna be mediated by an enzyme, right? These proteins that are gonna make sure that this happens, right? To keep the cell alive, you need these reactants and you need the enzyme to do that with, right? So what we're gonna do here is think about this whole homeostasis in terms of this enzyme, keeping this enzyme happy, right? So here's the enzyme. It looks something like this. He's got a certain shape, right, to perform its function. And he's happy and he's doing his job, right? In order for the enzyme to keep this particular shape right here, to be able to work, it needs a particular environment, right? And one of the things it needs is to have a particular pH, right? That is the amount of hydrogen ions floating around in here, right? And so this here is an example, one of the main examples, in fact, of a variable. And so when I we'll put a little heart next to that, right? Maintaining pH. If the pH is too high, if the pH is too high, it's not going to do its job. If the pH is too low, it's not going to do its job, right? So in the, under low pH conditions, that is too high acidity, the protein kind of loses its shape. And it's sad and it doesn't do its job right there, right? Because it lost its shape, right? Based on too many hydrogen ions, which we'll explain later, right? So if the pH is too low and it's too acidy, the protein isn't going to do, the enzyme isn't going to do its job. A won't be converted to B and the cell will die, right? So you need to maintain the proper level of hydrogen ions in there for this to happen. So this is called denaturing of the protein when the pH is going to affect the shape. Another thing that might denature the protein is if the temperature is too high. Okay. That's another variable temperature that you want to maintain. If the temperature is too high, right, this cell will lose its shape. This enzyme, I'm sorry, will lose its shape. If the temperature is too low, uh, the activity won't be high enough for it to work. It'll slow down and it won't work. So the temperature has got to be kept at just the right level, right? Not too hot, not too cold keeping that variable within that range right there, right? So, and then if it's not out of range, A won't be converted to B, what happens? Cell dies, right? That's what's going on in this so far with these variables, right? So for this enzyme to work, do its job, usually needs some kind of energy. It needs like this phosphate uh, molecule attached to it. And in order to do that, eventually you're going to come down to these other organelles that you may remember. Mitochondria. Right? What do mitochondria do? For us, they break down glucose and make ATP. Right? And to break down glucose, you need glucose to go into the cell. Right? So that's another variable, glucose. If you have too much glucose, you become uh, diabetic, right? You have hyperglycemia, right? Too much glucose in the body and your body has, causes all sorts of problems. And if you don't have enough glucose in your body, if you haven't maintained it, you don't get enough energy for the cell, right? This mitochondria doesn't make enough ATP and enzymes don't work. A and B A isn't converted to B, the cell dies. So you need to maintain the right level of glucose within proper physiological parameters. 
listening. What else do you need for this mitochondria to work? Well, this is where oxygen comes in, right? That whole electron transmate chain. This is the last electron acceptor for this to work, at least in aerobic uh, respiration. You need oxygen, right? So that's a main uh, physiological variable that has to be within physiological parameters. And usually it's just a matter of having enough oxygen circulating on the body, right? So if you don't have enough oxygen, you don't have that fast one, you can't do aerobic metabolism, right? you become hypoxic and the enzyme is not getting its ATP, not working and the cell dies, right? You get the picture here, everything needs to be maintained. All this stuff has gotta be brought in. And so energy, glucose, from breaking the bonds, oxygen for that. And so this isn't just floating around the cell. Where is it floating? Um, let's say it's floating in a surrounding, right? We're gonna call the extra cellular fluid. All cells are bathed in some sort of aqueous environment where glucose and oxygen, oxygen can diffuse through, right? But they're not just sitting there in the extracellular fluid, they have to be brought there, right? So what do we have right here? Blood vessel, what is blood vessel they're bringing? Well, they're bringing red blood cells. And do you want too many red blood cells? No, then the blood becomes viscous and things aren't moved through. If you have too few, then you don't have oxygen uh, coming out right there. So you need just the, uh, just the amount of red blood cells right, to, for have the, to have them deliver this oxygen in the proper way, right? So, you know, the amount of red blood cells is something that's maintained within physiological parameters, right? And then to push these blood cells through this capillary, blood pressure, right? You need a strong pressure forcing these things through, right? So make sure the blood, the, cap, the blood cells move through these capillaries and things perfuse out of it. Things like oxygen, glucose, and other stuff, right? And if you have not enough blood pressure, then the blood, this moves through too slowly. You don't get enough glucose. You don't get enough oxygen. Not enough ATP is made. Enzymes don't work. Cell dies. If you have too much blood pressure, that's another problem. The cells move through too fast and it puts a lot of strain on the vessel walls and they burst and you got a lot of damage. So blood pressure has to have be maintained in the correct physiological parameter, right? So that's another thing that has to be maintained. Not too much, not too little, right? So we're getting the general picture right here, right? Blood pressure, another physiological parameter. So the other thing is, it's not just glucose and oxygen. What else do we have that the body needs, right? You got, whoops, you got, Other nutrients like uh, amino acids, vitamins, those are special like coenzymes. You got lipids, stuff like that. So all that's in here traveling in the blood and it's going into the extracellular fluid and then it helps it to do its job. So all this kind of stuff also has to be maintained, right? In order for the cell to eventually live right there, right? All right, so minerals, stuff like that, nutrients and stuff like that. And then the other thing is maybe this cell is working very hard because it needs to, and then maybe it can relax, right? A lot of maybe some certain other conditions want to make this cell work harder. In order for that to happen, you have other things, well, other things traveling in here, right? Which bind to the cell over here come in here and tell this enzyme to maybe speed up or do something that changes it, right? And that'll be hormones, right? Within the blood, 
and that's another variable that's also you know part of the whole feedback system which we'll see but it's also you don't want too many hormones you don't want too little otherwise you come up with this endocrine imbalance the endocrinologies type stuff like some kind of disease related to too much or too little hormones right that are going to affect the activity of all the body cells right there so that's another thing that you got to maintain right controlling the cell's activity extracellular fluid here's the major thing right here right What's that extracellular fluid? What's the main component? Water. Right? If there's, say, in the blood and in the interstitial fluid and in here has to be maintained in just the right amount, right, within certain parameters. If there's too much water in the blood, more starts coming in the extracellular fluid. If there's too much water in the extracellular fluid, it starts going into the cell, right? We'll learn about this during osmosis and everything like that. The cell might burst, it might water things down. On the other hand, if you have too little water in the blood, then water in the extracellular fluid is gonna be drawn into the blood vessels. And that means water from the cell is gonna be drawn into the extracellular fluid. Here, the cell might shrink up and you don't have enough water to kind of uh, do the proper activity. So water is a huge water balance is one of the major sort of things that we are I'll put a couple of hearts next to that, right? It's a big factor, right? In something that we maintain proper levels of fluid, body fluid, which is mainly water. And then one of the ways we do that is by maintaining proper electrolyte levels. Sodium, potassium, right? Major ones like this. There's also major other ions like bicarb, right, uh, different, different phosphate ones. So all this is gonna be highly related to the maintenance of, you know, fluid flow in between these, right? Because water is gonna be controlled by the amount of sodium, right? So if there's too much sodium, you have this high blood pressure because you maintain, you retain a lot of water, right? And you also have other problems, right? If it's too much potassium, that's called hyper, Kalemia, hyperkalemia or hypokalemia, right? If you have, this is a basic one of the things that buffer your blood, your bicarbonate, right? If you have too much, you have too little, things go wrong, right? So all these are major things that have to be maintained, right? All these salts, they also have to be maintained because uh, they're often, you know, how the cell keeps its sort of electrophysiology functions going, right? The balance between sodium and potassium and stuff like that insert intracellular versus extracellular. So all these things are a major thing that needs to be maintained. Right. What else? Anything else? Electrolytes uh, produce, oh, last thing. What happens? All this work goes on. What else has to be maintained, right? When you bring in this glucose, you break it down, you break down amino acids and stuff. You use all this oxygen, all this, all this system, all this produces waste, right? So CO2, nitrogenous waste also has to be controlled. It becomes toxic. If too much CO2, the blood becomes very acidic. Too much of this makes this toxic, the cell dies, right? So you got to control the waste, right? Get rid of it, go in the body. Right, so CO2 is another parameter that's got to be maintained right here. Right, so when I say variables, you want to think of these specific examples, like some of the main ones that'll be over and over again. pH is a major one that we'll you know, be discussing right here. Water balance and these sodium and potassium, right? Not only the extracellular space and blood, but inside the cell itself, right? So these are major themes which are going to come up over and over again, right? Not too much, not too little, right? So when we talk about those physiological parameters and the, the variables that are disrupted, like how, why, why do you know, your salt levels go up or down? Why do oxygen levels, right? So when we talk about that, you know, the language we're gonna use for this, right? What are the things that are being disrupted? Like, what is it stimuli? right, is gonna be like the terminologies for disruptions, right? Other kind of equivalent terms might be a stressor or a disruptor, something that's harming 
that balance of not too much, not too little, right? It's pushing it in one direction, the wrong direction. All right, so these, this is the terminology we'll use when we're talking about homeostatic mechanisms, right? These are the things that are disruptors, right? That's the easiest way to think. Your book, I believe, we just go with the word stimuli, right? Second question is, how does the body know that things are being disrupted? How do we know we have too much sodium or too high blood pressure? It seems, uh, you know, if you think about it, it's kind of actually a difficult question, right? And so the terminology we're gonna use around this are detectors, some kind of detection, right? You're gonna have receptors that detect low oxygen or high CO2, right? So the word around here will be detectors or receptors or some kind of sensor. Right? So in our fishbowl, the disruptor was the decreasing temperature, just going to room temperature. And then that thermometer in there detected that it was falling below range. Right? And then how does the body organize a response? Well, these sensors must be connected to something that's going to affect a change. So this will be referred to as the control center. A right? control center that's going to do something about it. They're going to hear about this from all these sensors and stuff, and they're gonna formulate a plan to deal with it, right? And then the last question here are, what are the tissues, structures, or organs that actually bring about that change, right? And that would be called the effectors, right? These are the effectors. What is actually doing it, right? Your pancreas, your islet cells, and your pancreas are secreting insulin to deal with too high blood sugar, right? So these are all words we'll see when we talk about these homeostatic mechanisms to maintain, well, homeostasis, right? All right, so, you know, another just important point, right? It's not a precise thing. You don't need exactly 50 megs of glucose in your blood or whatever it is. I made that up. You don't exactly have to be at 37 degrees Celsius all the time, right? You can go a little bit out of range. You know, it's just when you get too high or too low, then things start to happen, right? But you're within a range, right? Your optimal temperature in this case, this is talking about the example of an air conditioner, right? Where you set it at 22, like your body set at 37 degrees Celsius or whatever, your glucose levels are set. So that as that set starts to go too far out of range, you start to become, you start to set in these homeostatic mechanisms to correct it. Right, so in this case, it starts to get a little bit warm, air conditioner turns on, right, and then it takes a little bit for it to start working, so it keeps on rising, but then it starts to have its effect, and the temperature starts dropping, right? Once it gets back into the actual set point right here, then that mechanism can stop. Right? It doesn't need to keep going on, it just keeps on turning off until it gets turned on again, right? So it'll respond in this case to any kind of deviation and then turn off when your body's back to normal, right? So your particular set points can change depending on what you're doing, right? Your normal heart rate might be different in different situations, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's a control mechanism, not precise. It's around a set point. There's oscillations and it can change, right? It's a major point here. So when we're talking about these homeostatic mechanisms, we're talking about these feedback systems, right? Things that monitor it like that, you know, thermometer or whatever that can detect it and set about a condition that changes it, right? So in this case, you know, we're talking about very generally speaking, uh, a stimulus, some kind of disruption to the system is gonna affect a controlled condition, right? Or a variable. Right? All those things, pH, temperature, blood sugar, uh, salt levels and stuff like that, right? A variable, it's gonna affect it, it gets out of range. It's picked up by a receptor. That receptor tells the control center in some way. And then that control center is going to have some sort of message to a, an effector, which is actually going to bring about the change, right? We'll also use the words input, output, afferent pathway, efferent pathway as we go along. So these are some of the terminologies you might see right here, right? So in this case, the stimulus was too high sugar levels, 
right? And that was affecting your blood glucose levels. This is picked up by pancreatic beta cells, right? Uh, and there, and they're also the ones that actually send out the insulin, right? And that would actually go ahead and allow cells to take in more glucose, bring the glucose levels down and return to normal levels, right? So this is your general sort of feedback system, monitoring disruptions, right, or changes and response to it. And there's two general types of these feedback systems. The main one that we'll be dealing with, vast majority of all the feedback systems, your body are what's called negative feedback systems. That air conditioner thing is a negative feedback system. The glucose levels are a negative feedback system. That's the normal sort of thing, right? Where it reverses, right? Just like the temperature was going up, the air conditioner is turned on, then it's going to reverse that. It's going to bring that temperature back down, right? So in this case, the you know the variable they're talking about here is blood pressure, right? So something is making it to go too high, right? There's these receptors within your blood vessels that pick up that blood pressure, and it's going to send the information to your brain. Your brain's going to pass that information on to your heart, maybe you know, our different blood vessels and stuff that are going to, you know, if the blood pressure in this case was too high, right, maybe it'll slow down the heart, maybe it'll dilate the blood vessels to kind of decrease the pressure, and then it'll start, the blood pressure will start to decrease, right, so that's the response, right, a decrease in heart rate, uh, dilation of blood vessels, start to bring it back, right, uh, you start to get back bang, to around the set point right here, that's detected and all that mechanism stop, right? So all those, you could stop, you could bring the heart rate back to normal, bring the blood, blood vessel dilation back to normal, and then you're back in within range right here, right? This is negative feedback, right? You've gone away from it, and then you're gonna bring it back toward the actual beginning impulse, right? So that's negative feedback system. And that is your, should be the center of your attention when we're thinking about this. There's also positive feedback systems. And this is very different. This is very particular circumstances, right? When you read about it, you mostly read about uh, during labor and delivery, right? Uh, in the case, in this case, you are, the cervix is being stretched beyond its normal condition and receptors pick that up. And instead of saying, hey, that is stretching, let's bring it back to normal. It says, oh, it's stretching, a baby must be coming out. Let's make it stretch more, right? Let's make it contract more and everything and push the baby out, right? So it's gonna promote that same original sort of disruption over there, right? It's gonna intensify that, right? So in this case, it's not re restoring homeostasis, this kind of specialized condition where it wants to accelerate that uh, disruption, right? And it's very rare, right? There's only a particular couple of conditions where you want that. Another more common one might be blood clotting, right? Once, uh, once there's a sort of loosening of, you know, once there's a damage in the blood vessel and stuff, there's certain conditions which tend to accelerate based on that to kind of restore the situation, right? So these are usually emergency conditions and we'll come to it as, as they come along there, but we really want to we want to focus on the negative feedback because these are very particular situations, but these do definitely exist. They're, they're in your book and you will run into them at some point. All right, that's positive feedback systems. It's an acceleration of that original disruption instead of returning it to normal. And then eventually, right, it'll go back to normal. It'll stop. All right. So for those, many of those mechanisms, right, you're going to have all that stuff we talked about, right? uh, your nervous system, your endocrine system, your, you know, this, this is going to do widespread, these two are going to do widespread maintenance of homeostasis, right? Your kidneys are another big one that are going to, you know, regulate your fluid volume as well as all your electrolyte levels, right? So these are like major systems that are dealing with different kinds of homeostatic, homeostatic parameters. 
physiological parameters. So these are systemic control. There's also local control. Right? So in this case, this is a blood vessel. You have decreased oxygen levels um, and inc or increased carbon dioxide levels. Right? That's going to directly promote a widening of the blood vessels to bring in more blood flowing through here so more oxygen comes through right you don't need a you know the rest of you know you don't need sort of systemic control this is going to happen locally right but most of for us for our part we typically i shouldn't say that i don't know what they how much they go into this but for my part i'm going to be talking about these uh more systemic controls of these homeostatic mechanisms right so this is the last slide about homeostasis here you know, it's all about this keeping variables within physiological parameters. You know what that means now. And the big point is, you know, you don't want to get into hyperglycemia, hyperkalemia, hypothermia, uh, edema, um, what else? Dehydration, right? All these are illnesses and stuff that are going to eventually lead to either you know, bad illnesses or death, right? That's failure to maintain homeostasis, right? So that is your little part on homeostasis.